Okay, I think it's, oh, there, I found a blinking red dot. We're recording. We're going to um, review Desert or Paradise. I have six people with me today, and uh, we're going to review up to and through page 16, starting with the preface. Now, one, one thing I kind of noticed just reading it so far is um, you can you can definitely tell that they translated it from German to English. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of phrasing where it just, I don't, I've, I've been to so many presentations with SEP where there's a translator where it's like the way things are said, it sounds like they're doing their best to translate German into English. And this book is like exactly that. I don't know how to describe how I detect that. I don't know if any of you feel the same way. Well, German is a very structured language. And so I think that if you're doing translation from German, it's going to sound very formal. Yeah, formal. There's yeah. that. Yeah. Um, definitely see a lot of the words that uh, Sepp Holzer uses a lot. Um, and on top of that, I don't know if it's because I have now written a book and I've been through comma patrol hell, <laughs> also known as the editing phase. Um, but it's like, I've noticed a, not only grammatical errors, but typos. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else is noticing this. I haven't noticed any spelling errors, but. Just one one little typo I saw. Okay. Yeah, they happen. Yeah, no, it's they're okay. gonna they're gonna sneak through. I just kind of feel like I don't normally ever notice them, but maybe I'm noticing them because I've been through comma patrol hell. You're a new person now. You're a published author, so you have a new outlook. As maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. So um, uh, there's there's definitely a Holzerian flavor to these words i i think i think that um like whoever did the translation for sepulchre's permaculture like translated it to english and then they took that english version and then they translated that to english does is this making any sense to anybody like so like, are you like, saying that the other book by Seb Holzer sounds more conversational and this one sounds a little more stilted? Yes. I'm going to say that. Um, okay. And okay. And, then, and it's worth mentioning for people who haven't listened to all the podcasts that you have spent some time in person with Seb Holzer. I have spent more than 30 full days uh, hanging with Seb Holzer. Yeah. Yeah, which I'm sure yeah, it is... says it was uh, translated by Thomas Holzer. Oh, his son. I'm assuming is his... ah nepotism. What? <laughs> well, that's one well, way to make sure that it's translated sort of fairly and accurately, but it, it does sort of account for the 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 delivery, shall we say, of it, and it it is rather commanding. Um, and less invitational. So wait, that might be a coincidence. Thomas Holzer spells his last name differently. Oh, oh. Yeah. you're right. Well. It's Joseph. Yeah, it's oh, right. Joseph. Okay. Well, in any case, it is. I, Paul, I agree with you. It it, um, it isn't the easiest text to like sit down and enjoy on a lovely day, hiding in your chair. It takes some work to read it. Well. Okay, I mean, these are the words of the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holter. So I mean, the fact that it's translated at all is awesome. And I kind of feel like the, the way it's presented is actually quite, quite good. I, I, I guess, um, you know, I would have, I would have accepted less. Does that make so? But but yeah, I was just kind of reading it, and I was kind of feeling like um, like yeah, there is a there is a flavor to this that you've gotta you've gotta have a little bit more hunger perhaps to drink from the Sepp Holzer fountain 
to, you know, to eagerly eat up these words. Now, here's a cool thing. And that is that, okay, so we're, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube, we've got the, the, the what the cover looks like, Desert or Paradise. And we're on the Goodreads page. And uh, uh, so we've got Kyle. Kyle's being our image bitch. Thank you, Kyle, for stepping up. Thanks for calling me a bitch. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but look at that. 4.7 oh wait okay it's 4.78 stars it's got 18 ratings i know that my book on goodreads has 4.20 stars and i know this because i am a disgusting vulgar self-pub author who looks at this page almost every day to see if that number has changed <laughs> And I know, like, Toby Hemingway told me that he did this all the time. He couldn't stop himself from, like, looking. And uh, uh, so now I'm one of those guys. I'm one of those authors. I'm looking at this all of the time. Oh, I want this number to go up. Ooh, it's got 149 ratings. That's, that's one more than the last time I looked. But that was the point I was making is mine's got 149 and his had 18. And I'm thinking, like, surely more people have read Desert or Paradise than have read my book. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, but 4.78, that is that is way super duper high. I mean, mine is 4.20. And on Goodreads, that's like considered one of the very best books on all of Goodreads. But 4.78 is unheard of. But the one I saw that how many reviews it had, then it's like, oh, oh. So um, this oh. is Opalin, and apparently this book has two accounts or entries on Goodreads. Oh. And one has 18 ratings and one has 55 ratings. What's the how many stars does the one with 55 have? 4.25. There we go. There's the other one. So it's still better than me, but um, it's got more ratings. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I'm new to Goodreads. Uh, I don't think I ever looked at Goodreads until I my book came out, and it's like, oh, this is this is the place. You gotta you gotta go look. Uh, I guess. And so, um, and uh, um. There's so much more to it that I don't understand. And I want to talk about all the things I don't understand and then have everybody help me <laughs> to understand what I don't understand. Um, but OK, skippity, skip, skip, skip. I was just thinking like very, very highly rated, despite these little things that we were just that I was just quibbling about, um, where it's like, oh, it's, it, it kind of is. Uh, and, and I would have to say that the difficulty in reading it is trivial, really. The Paul, may I yeah. introduce the, your concept of the Wheaton Eco Scale here? And <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering if um, one needs to be at a certain level on the Wheaton Eco Scale to even comprehend what Sepp is talking about. Ooh. And if that Please. Oh man, Elliot! Am I the only person here's Elliot kind of going into robot mode? Yeah, he's yes. under right here. Really? Oh, that's bad. I'll be yeah. quiet. <laughs> Regular Elliot's fine. It's robot Elliot that we hate. Robot Elliot. And so, uh, by the way, this is probably a good time to mention that everybody on this call with me is a, a patreon supporter and so uh trying to you know do trying to beef up that patreon thing which you know i i'm hoping will make everything else work after that <laughs> all all good things will come from this but thank you everybody for being a, a patreon supporter you're helping to get everything to work and i'm i want to get my I want to do more of my podcasts and I'm, I'm glad you guys are here to help me with this today. And, uh, I, I know I enjoy this kind of format. The, uh, the thing where we review books page by page. 
Well, I'm really glad to, to be part of the Patreon program. This is my first year being part of the Patreon program, and I waited, I don't know why, for years and years. I'm not above the poverty line, and so I was like, oh, I can't really afford it. But, you know, you can you can sign up for Patreon with $1 a month or $1 per, uh, like, max per month for things that come out. And so it's it, it can be budgeted, and it, the feeling of being able to support something you believe in, I find that really valuable to me, like, like definitely more than whatever I was going to do with that dollar <laughs> before. <laughs> so if you if you feel like if you've been on the fence and you're thinking of doing it, but you're worried about spending too much, you really can set it to a reasonable amount. Um, if you want to have that feeling of participating, it's really fun. So I recommend it. I I think all those little dollars add up, and it really, you know, helps us to put the the podcasts out and 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 get them recorded. I mean, I know that we've got like 200 new topics that we really need to address and probably a hundred books that we need to do process this way. And um, it, and when the, when the, the Patreon thing is heavily loaded up, it, it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. If we keep making these podcasts, that'll pay for all the things and keep the boot program going and all that stuff. So, but right now it's kind of edge case. There's, there's a little bit of money there, but not a not a lot. Um, and uh, I kind of felt like, well, if we make more, we'll get more Patreon supporters. All right, <clears throat> so much for the begging for money section of of today's podcast. Uh, moving moving along, very high rating on Goodreads, and I think that that's to counter the um, the slight. Uh, Germanic flavor of the English um, and uh, uh, and stuff like that. So um, I, I we've read up through page 16. I felt that there were some things that were like really profound to me. I, mean, I have not read this book yet. I've I've owned this book for years. In fact, I think I think Maddie Harland, the publisher, sent me this. Um, in the hopes that I would do the thing that we're doing right now, which which is doing the page by page review, and I've been choosing to not open it, which has been painful for me, uh, until we do this this kind of review. All right, <clears throat> before we start doing the uh, line by line review of this book, has anybody got anything else they want to add about it? Nope. Okay. I do. Oh yes. I do. Um, so my comment is sort of um, tying. Anyway, I'll just dive into it. Um, so while I was attending the Evergreen State College, um, my teachers often commented that our biosphere was failing. And they told us that it's our job to fix it. But they never told us how. And I sort of felt like that was a lot of the first part of chapter one. So I flipped through the book and I found like five things. And it was just amazing to have such a small book in my hand that actually started talking about how. Now at Evergreen, I thought that was one of the few places where you actually do things. Like, like okay, today we're gonna build a cob house, all right? We're gonna get our hands literally dirty. You know, is that um, not true? That would be permaculture experiences, according to Paul, um, <laughs> not Evergreen State College. Okay. Um, Evergreen is a very integrated school. So you take a program that has chemistry and biology and math and often a fourth component um, for the whole year. And so you're not like picking and choosing and getting chemistry by itself and math by itself and biology by itself, but you're learning how they all integrate. Okay. Um, but I would not call it a doing college. <laughs> oh, I, I thought I've met some people from Evergreen and they had, they like showed me pictures of things they literally built while like as part of a class at Evergreen. Um, and I thought, wow, wow. I thought all colleges everywhere were to sit on your butt, stare at the teacher and, um, you know, then take tests. But I want to counter something that you said 
And that is that um, the, uh, the things that are often taught at schools that are going to be in environmental programs are that, um, uh, man, think we are so fucked. And, uh, yeah. and the level of fucked is rising. Look, I got a graph for you to look at. Here's, here's how fucked we were before, not as fucked. Here's where we are now, very. And then if you follow the graph into the future, here's, here's where we all die. See that? See, I made a graph. Shows us all dying, all in a graph. Pretty nice, huh? We're gonna teach you how to make graphs like this, and and the only solution that you're gonna be provided is to call politicians and be angry at them for fucking us over like this. Because we didn't do this, right? It was all only those politicians. That's that's who did it. So, um, <clears throat> is I I believe that that's how most uh, university experiences go. Is, was was that kind of what Evergreen did? Um, so I did a lot of like theory and practice, but in my natural sciences courses, I didn't have things to take home at the end of the day. Like I also, um, I needed a, a different sort of mental space. So over the summer I took a, an art course and <laughs> I, I made mosaic artwork and that was glasswork. It was beautiful and a lot of fun. But that was the only time that I like took home things that were not paper. Okay, so now you push the button on Julia. I'm surprised Julia's not already. No what? <laughs> saying mosaic. Oh, oh, right. oh. <laughs> I love mosaic. I okay, love but... mosaic. I haven't done it recently. <laughs> all right, all right. So um, the part about the part I'm saying about. The thing, the, the, the thing that you do to fix everything according to the uh, a, a college message is to be angry at politicians, be angry at the bad guys. And is that accurate? Is that part accurate? Um, I would say that there's not a lot else. There are few other options presented in, in my experience. And there's okay. a lot of activism at Evergreen. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when I was a young fella, I was certain that that was the thing also. And um, and now here we are. I, I have a whole different mindset. And I believe Sepp Holzer has a different mindset also. That's what we're going to study today. And so your message was is that you skipped ahead and you were – finding man this guy has amazing shit at solving global problems and, yeah i just uh, i needed to make sure that the whole book wasn't going to be the same message i got in college and so yeah oh, i did yeah. i read a few pages and it was really really like inspired me to keep reading chapter one because i was i was like half ready to be done with chapter one if that's what the whole book was going to be <laughs> i do feel like there are some golden nuggets uh, in this yeah. first part that we're going to review today. Um, but I, I kind of feel like it's not the kind of meat that I really want. The kind of meat that I expect from Sepp Holzer. But, but um, I, I do believe that there is this smidgen of thing. And I know, I know I've mentioned it in the, in the podcast before where I, I wish I had this mental superpower that Sepp has, where when there's the negative Nellies, he just waves his hand at them, his dismissive hand wave, and says, they're just jealous. Which, by <laughs> the way, is like, it's, it's his catchphrase for so many things uh, you hear it almost as much as when anybody presents an idea and he says catastrophe or catastrophin. <clears throat> um, but I, I do think it's an admirable mindset. Um, I, think, I think his path is like, I'm going to save you whether you like it or not. I'm going, I'm going to save everything and you better just shut the fuck up and get the get out of my way. 
and I, I just don't feel, I, I feel like I'm, I am almost that arrogant, but not quite. And uh, I, I, I kind of feel like I, I need the, I need more people to embrace this stuff than currently are. And so I want to try to understand why they are not. And, and this way that SEP has might be part of it. I think that the how to that he presents, um, or or maybe it's not the how-to as much as it is, is like, hey, look what I made. Hey, it fixes everything. See? All right? <laughs> Just shut the fuck up and know that it fixes everything. Okay? No, I said shut up. Just nod your head, okay? Like, that's... And we've got Now we've got the information. We've got the knowledge that we needed. But we're kind of missing this bridge to it. And, and there's a lot of people that are easily distracted by shiny objects that are not crossing the bridge. And I'm trying to understand how, how to get them on that bridge and get all the way across. Does that make sense? Am I just babbling? It's hard. So I, I feel like there's a, there's a piece missing. And I feel like my book helps get people to this information in a way. Does anybody else have anything they want to say before we go to the preface by Sepp Holzer on page V-I-I-I? Nope. <laughs> no. All right. Here is the preface by Sepp Holzer. And uh, um, <clears throat> our, our policy is, is that uh, when we're doing these reviews, that we try to read no more than 10% of the book into uh, the podcast um, because that seems like about where the fair use line is drawn. And then, of course, uh, the other thing, that, the other ingredient that we mix into all of this to help us to, to do this sort of review is to say, hey, you know, it'd be great is if you went out and bought the book, right? Oh, look at that picture. You know, you'd really appreciate this picture I'm looking at right now if you bought the book. <laughs> And, uh, oh, look, a table, which I cannot read in, into the, a podcast. Uh, you'd see the table if you, bought, if you bought the book. Things like that. So you guys help me with reminding people to buy the book. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to now read the very first paragraph of the preface by Sepp Holzer. Our thinking is far too short term. This is the grave conclusion I keep coming to after receiving feedback about my books, presentations, and workshops. Nowadays, most people want immediate solutions and recipes to existing problems. They do not think beyond today and tomorrow. They neglect to tune into nature. They neglect to tie past, present, and future together. They want everything now ready to use, prepared by someone else. To me, this is not a life worth living. <sighs> okay. Um, I think I agree with a lot of that. If, if a lot of people, because I think permaculture is a, is a large holistic thing, and it's also kind of, a lot of it is, is, is to admit that the system is more complicated than we will ever understand. Therefore, what we're attempting to do to solve problems will not fit on a bumper sticker. And so- Yeah, I've when, had that conversation with people who have just kind of done a half hour, like, or, but you know, or a 30 second or whatever, read about like the permaculture Wikipedia page and they say, well, it's it's too complicated. It doesn't work everywhere. It's, you know, it's not, like you said, it's not a bumper sticker kind of thing. And it's it, it's kind of frustrating. I I have I have seen permaculture people reject 
permaculture stuff because it's not sitting in front of them right now. I've seen, I have seen permaculture people reject permaculture stuff because it's right now it's winter. So permaculture stuff will not work because I cannot see it right now and it's winter. I cannot imagine that there would ever be another time but winter, therefore it doesn't exist. It's it's like they you like even when you talk about sepulchre stuff in Austria, it cannot work here because I'm in the United States, which is not Austria. Or when we see pictures like the ones on the screen right now, which I'm pretty sure those are in Portugal, and it's like, oh. Those things won't work here because that's Portugal and this is the United States. It's bizarre how people can latch on to a disconnect so instantly. And I kind of feel like we just, we got to have more examples of such intense polyculture and these techniques in and all over the United States, just so that, you know, you can drag somebody kicking and screaming and put it in front of them and then watch them, you know, grab at totally different excuses. Like the excuses that they had 10 seconds ago about Portugal suddenly are washed away and now they find a new set of excuses. That's so funny because permaculture, it seems like is the opposite of that that if you listen if you sit with nature and, and listen even in the winter even in random places in the world you could find permaculture things to do there and right then it's so the opposite of what i think of as permaculture i i i all right <clears throat> i've I, i've got all these new philosophies and stuff but i'm gonna i'm gonna skip past all of those but the, the, the thing is, is that for this paragraph, he starts off his very first sentence, our thinking is far too short term. And I kind of feel like, um, I, like they do. So many people, it's like, if I'm going to grow a garden, I want to plant the seeds, like as I'm thinking of it, which turns out to be August. And I, I'm going to plant tomato seeds in the ground in August, like August 1st. And I better be eating tomatoes on August 7th or this is fucking stupid and I'm out. It's, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, first of all, any form of gardening is a patience game. But I, I kind of feel like um, if you're going to garden for 20 years, isn't it preferable to have a kind of a garden where as you get older, the garden care gets easier I mean, I think that after five years of gardening, you start to say, oh, man, this is the fifth year that I've done the exact same thing and I'll get the exact same crop. And I wish I could grow even more food, but I, I can't come up with that much more time. So what I'm going to do is, um, well, yeah, anyway, <clears throat> with permaculture, then it's like you get to the point where five years down the road, you could stop gardening altogether and just harvest. And then you'll get this, you get an, an immense amount of food out of the system with just harvesting. I think, you know, and it's all about, part of it is, is the complexity of it, but part of it is how it can be simple if you'll let it be simple. But when you see row gardening and you, you've, like that's what you've experienced is row gardening, then it kind of seems like then that's that's what you keep wanting to go back to. But I kind of feel like if we had more examples of permaculture, more people would go with the flow of the permaculture system. All right, I'm going to move on to the next piece. Uh, this is the last piece I've marked in the preface. Um, this book is not a recipe book, even though it offers practical advice. I will deal with details, but I will not spoon feed you. This is a big complaint a lot of people have about permaculture is that um, they, they open up a permaculture book and then um, they might even like 
do exactly what they found in the permaculture book. They'll be living in Montana and they'll go and build a whole bunch of swales and they'll plant jackfruit and bananas and pineapples. And then they'll be like, it didn't work. This stuff is all stupid. <clears throat> and it's kind of like, yeah, in, in Montana, those things won't, don't work so good. And, and I so, knew I should have done that. What's that? I said, oh, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Right. If I had just done it the way that the row croppers do it, I would, it would have worked. And they're right. Cause, so that's why permaculture books are so vague. It's because it's kind of like, we need to give you the ideas. We need to give you the mechanics without getting specific. Because wherever you are, it's going to be a little weird. And so the specifics don't do well. I, I know that like, um, I've heard a lot of people say that they can't do what Joel Salatin does because Joel Salatin's in uh, a place where the topsoil is six feet deep, just like universally everywhere, this amazing topsoil. So now anything that he does is going to turn to gold horticulturally because of those deep, deep soils. Whereas but other here's places... the thing. Sorry, Paul. I, I just I want to say that I've read some of his work and he talks about how it was dead, bare patches of earth all over the place when he moved or started what he's doing. No, absolutely. So people, you know, exactly what Sepulcher is saying, like people thinking is far too short term. At the same time, like where like where I am right now, we've got two properties, base camp and the lab and base camp is like uh, a 20 acre rock like one rock those of you that have been here and have seen <laughs> like <clears throat> oh, confirm Lots yeah. of rock. rock yeah so there's the bedrock right there at the surface you can see it like everywhere and, um, uh, but Joel Salatin, he has, at least when he started on that property, he started with dirt, which he in time converted to soil. Um, but yeah, if you're starting off with, with dirt or rock, and granted rock is gonna be a whole different kind of challenge. Like Salatin's techniques would fail on this rock. Um, I mean, not completely, you would get some progress using his techniques. I mean, so so here's a, a, a picture Kyle has pulled up and you can see all of the chickens that Salatin has. And and the thing is that Salatin buys feed, feeds it to the chickens, then the chickens poop it all out all over the place. And so it's kind of like with that much organic matter ending up on the soil, yeah, you'll grow, <laughs> you'll grow stuff. Whereas if it, before it was just a solid rock, now it's a solid rock with a layer of poop on it. Um, things will grow out of that. <laughs> you can get started. It'll do better than before when it was just solid rock. So there will be improvements. <clears throat> All right. Um, I am going to move on. I'm going to skip the uh, the sections on acknowledgement. I'm going to skip who is Sepp Holzer? Unless you guys have anything out of acknowledgement or who is Sepp Holzer you want to share? No. I wanted to say that I got this book, uh, the Eve version, and I have an Android phone. I got the Kindle reader, which was free. And so if you if you feel like not having by the, the digital version, especially if you want to read through it every week or, or every podcast with us. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to jump into chapter one, reading nature. Um, by the way, whenever Sep doesn't want to answer a question because of whatever reason, whether it's his, his secret sauce or it's, um, or he doesn't know the answer to your question or whatever, he always says, you must read the book of nature. And then he puts his hands out and opens his hands as if he's opening a book. And, and this is his whole shtick. You must read the book of nature. So. 
Does he have it on his shirt? What's that? Does he have that on a shirt, like a t-shirt? <laughs> I, I have a t-shirt with the Book of Nature. I got it at the first Permaculture Voices. Ah, oh, um, awesome. <laughs> All right, reading nature. Uh, separation from nature is the biggest problem. He says, people having distant the, distanced themselves from nature, thinking they know better than nature, are a great catastrophe. All right, is it just me or is this one of those places where the grammar is a little wonky? People having distanced themselves from nature, thinking they know better than nature, are a great catastrophe. Right. <laughs> I still understand what he's trying to say. And I, I love the part, thinking they know better than nature. I mean, it, it seems like it seems like in my experience, I get in way too many weird, stupid arguments with dumb fucks. And the, the thing is, is that these people feel like they know all there is to know and that the things that they're saying are the thing, the end, this is it. This is, this is the, the final bit. Um, and it, I kind of feel like I, you know, by reading this, I, I feel like Sep gets it. Um, so uh, the, the key is, is, is mostly this thing where they know better, where they believe they know better. And then, of course, they are the great catastrophe. This is one of his favorite words, catastrophin. Um the next part I have marked off is several pages later on page four. Does anybody have anything before page four they want to talk about? Um, I had quite a few. I have something marked off for most pages, but if we want to skip ahead. No, 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 no. Um, Do your I like bit. The part where I like uh, the part here down below. I am totally convinced of this. Whatever I do in life, I need to take responsibility for it. I need to act with responsibility towards nature, however she presents herself in a tree, a pig, a stream, or a grasshopper. Uh, yeah, I think that was, um, that kind of stood out for me. Um, and I wonder how you keep yourself from, when you do put yourself in the, you know, look, try to look at the world from that point of view to not uh, anthropomorphize those things or project our wants onto those things when you're looking at it from their view. So if you're contemplating the tree and yeah. you're trying to put yourself in the tree's position, step one, don't anthropomorphize the tree. Right. Instead, don't, don't, yeah. tree, tree the fuck up. Right. Or so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make the tree into something human. I'm going to make me into more of a tree. Then I'm going to exactly. activate the empathy. Okay. What's what? Yeah. What's up with this tree? Like, what is you know? The, <clears throat> to observe a healthy tree, and then to observe the same species of tree as a sad tree then you know what is this i i kind of feel like um sep holter's design stages is like if i see a space where something is wrong and it's a space where i want it to be different than what it is then rather than thinking like i'm going to go in there and mulch and fertilize and i'm gonna you know kill the bugs and I'm going to, you know, force it to be what I want today. Instead, he looks at it as more of, I have, I, clearly my design here has failed. How do I improve my design? And uh, uh, I, I kind of like, I really like that 
approach rather than like um, uh, something like when you see, uh, in fact, his, his position on aphids is rather fascinating and I still, I'm still trying to come up to speed on it. I feel like I am not yet to, to full Holzer status on aphids, but his position is, is that there are many species of plant that cannot survive without aphids. The mm. aphids, the aphids are required. But if he sees a plant that is dying from too many aphids, then he's kind of thinking, how did I design this so poorly that the plant that I wanted to keep is now being overrun by aphids? So rather than like, I want to go kill all the aphids and smash all the aphids or bring a bunch of ladybugs here or, you know, all the different things that I might do to get rid of the aphids. How do I change the design of this spot so that way this species of plant will thrive here instead of suffer under aphid damage? Well, there's also kind of looking at it from the point of view of the individual uh, as opposed to the, the species as a whole. Like if I want to do what's right for a given tree, if I want to look at it from its point of view, what does it want? It wants to grow and make a bunch of little copies of itself. It wants to totally depopulate the earth except for little copies of itself that individual, whereas, you know, looking at, you gotta take a bigger view than, like, what what he said isn't that simple. You gotta, you know, an individual pig wants to, you know, root around and, and eat all the food in the entire world and lay around and have a bunch of babies, but like, that's not good for pigs as a whole, or for trees as a whole, or for people as a whole. Very good point. So, All right. uh, yeah, I don't know. Making one individual happy, like look at me. I don't know. I don't know where. I don't know. It's a big like. Uh, it's a big topic of discussion from my point of view. What else do you have before page four? Was that Julia? Did you have something to add? Was that who else was? Somebody was saying. Something. Um. I have something on page. No, not Julia. It's oh. Opalin. Opalin. And there's like several, um, even just sentences in this book so far that I could spend like hours or days like pondering. And what Kyle was just talking about leads into like the next sentence that I really found um, important, profound, inspiring. And that is nature provides all the energy we need to act appropriately. And so like that inspires kinds of all, all the things that go into that okay how do we scale back from our addiction to fossil fuel so that we can act appropriately <laughs> and it's just a really thought-provoking piece and there are many of them i i i do think that to answer your question how do we um how do we wean ourselves off of our addiction to fossil fuels and anything else that we think is probably uh, less than wholesome? And um, I think that uh, the first step is always try a little bit. I mean, I, I kind of feel like a lot of people will first say something like, well, I, I need my car to go to work and I don't have any other way to get to work. So, you know, therefore, I'm not going to try anything at all. And I think that um, I, I think that there's there's long lists of things that are like tiny things that a person could do, and um, and eventually it, you you get better and better and better, and you get closer and closer and closer to your goal as the years pass. I think that I now use like a quarter of the petroleum that I used 20 years ago. I think it might even be less than that. It might be like more like a tenth of the petroleum that I used 20 years ago from just trying little things and yeah. more and more. Um, but anyway, Kyle, 
Do you have something yes. else before page four? Hey, all right. Um, let's see. On uh, page three and four, kind of spanning that, uh, the topic about he he talks about how deforestation is kind of uh, not kind of leads to uh, catastrophes, um, and he um, makes a very good. Um, you know, like a case, like you cut down the tree, this is what happens, like directly. And it really makes a lot of sense. And then uh, going into page four, he has two things um, talking about how tree monocultures are not the answer. You have to have a diverse forest to reverse um, this effect. And then in the next section under water is key, he talks about um, your. Uh, uh, your how like the reservoirs how they're done now do the opposite of what they are you need to have you can't have a square uh, you know flat bottom concrete reservoir that won't do what you need to do you need to have your uh, you know your edge effect uh, um, your crenulated edge of the of the pond and you need to have different depths and all that all that good stuff, and I thought that was uh, very good. And there was a correlation between the two. Does anybody else have anything from before water is the key? I do. Nope. Go, nope. go Katie, go. Well, um, I thought it was super fascinating. Only cool soil absorbs rainwater. And so if the soil is warmer than the rain, the water will roll over the surface of the ground and cannot penetrate beneath it. Yeah. I thought that was fascinating. I want to run out and test it. Like I, I never heard that before, and it's really important to me. And so I, I, I think that's amazing. Um, the forests are so important. Uh, and I have a, I have a general desert-related question for any time later, whenever you want. Oh, uh, well, I, I think we should strike while the iron's hot. What's your desert related we are reading a book called desert or paradise and uh and you, you can ask your question and i'm assuming you're asking me and i'm kind of feeling like while missoula is technically mountain desert i kind of feel like it's it's not the same level of desert like we see in the pictures here which i think that that top picture i think that that's the spain project but the bottom picture is the Portugal project. It seems like they'd be the same place. Anyway, what, Katie, is your desert question? Thank you, my desert question. When I first looked at the book, I was thinking, oh, desert or paradise. This is going to be like a how-to of how to turn a desert into a paradise. I was completely wrong about that, wild guess, looking at the title. <laughs> but it, made, it did make me think about... Um, how any place can be a desert. In fact, a lot of places that I thought were like a natural desert are perhaps were long ago not at all a desert. And that the trees and the forests and the water systems there have just been so disrupted that it has become a desert. And so my my thought and question is, is it is there a desert ecosystem to aim for? Or if you could get and more and more into the system, or is like is desert not good unless it's the best you can get? Uh, you're reminding me of a lot of people who got very upset with, oh man, Zimbabwe, help me out. Bill help me Mollison, out. the whole. Not Bill Mollison, um, the, the TED talk, Alan oh. Savory. We oh. got upset with Alan Savory because they're like, deserts are cool. You're trying to destroy all deserts. And and no, actually, there are some parts of the world that are going to be desert almost no matter what you do. But a whole lot of the planet that we think of as desert, that's been desert for hundreds, even over a thousand years, was has been desertified by the actions of humans. True. And that can be restored. So it's not that desert is bad. It's just that so much of what looks like desert 
doesn't need to be desert. But a lot of, so ecosystems happen. That could be a shirt. I, I mean, over, especially a long period of time, there's gonna come developing whatever can exist in the ecosystem. Like at the bottom of the sea, inside the very hot vents, there's little microbes that are happy there. I mean, I feel like given long enough, any system is an ecosystem, but are we, like, it seems good. It seems like when you add topsoil, when you add biodiversity, like what good measure of more and more diversity until the system is um, sustaining itself. Well, a bare rock is just, is you know sustaining itself pretty good. What if you've got right? Like... Well, he, here's an interesting. <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. Interesting... Okay, so here's an interesting thing. There's I have heard a reasonably strong argument that most of Australia was not as deserty as it looks now. And the interesting thing is, it was the aboriginals who hunted the megafauna to extinction that led to the desertification of Australia. Hmm. So it's been going on in different places uh, you know, for a long time. We, we often hear about the Middle East and being called the Fertile Crescent. And yet, if you go and look, it doesn't look very fertile. It's changed. And that was one of the first places that people started plowing the ground. But I did think it was really interesting to think that desertification could happen without a plow. And that was the argument I heard about Australia that it was the loss of the megafauna that led to desertification. I want to take a stab, and that is that suppose you have, I don't know, a million acres of desert. And in the middle of that desert, you have 40 acres that is desert. And you decide to turn it into a lush jungle. And uh, it takes 50 years, but you start off by you know, planting a few trees and nurturing those trees to be bigger and then a few more trees, et cetera. You do all the, all the permaculture things. So out of a million acres, you've got this one little patch that you've created a, a different culture, a different, a di you've created a different thing. And so it's kind of like, uh, all right, so um, have you screwed up what was there? It seems like there's still plenty of this ecosystem, this desert ecosystem. There's gobs of desert ecosystem. Um, and you've only introduced this small alternative ecosystem. In in this particular scenario that I mentioned, does does that seem okay? Then I'm thinking we're, we're all going to say, yeah, that that seems like that's that's okay. But of course, the next step comes is like, okay, well, what if we took all of the million acres and converted it over this new thing? So there's no more desert left. Is that okay? And then I think. The answer is going to be, boy, that that's debatable. Some people are going to argue that, you know, at half you should have stopped, or at ten percent you should have stopped, or at ninety percent you should have stopped. Um, and some people are going to argue that at, a, at no, it's perfectly fine right now. It's better now by our sets of standards. Now, of course, with a million acres of desert, is it? Are we going to obliterate? any kind of biological distinctiveness along the way? I mean, there's other deserts. Do they have the same biological distinctiveness? And that will continue. Um, another question is, is like this patch, this million acre patch of desert, was it always a desert? Like before people showed up? And it's like, that gets a little dodgy because, 
I mean, people kind of started showing up at about the time that the last ice age ended. And it's, so it's kind of like uh, things were kind of wiped out then anyway. What would what would nature be doing if there were no human beings? And that's their argument. So the, the when we start exploring this question of is this an OK thing to do? It can end up in an awkward space. Now let's take the same set of skeptical eyes and turn them on the United States of America farmland. And it's kind of like, okay, this used to be a forest and now it's been, all of the swamps have been drained. All of the rivers have been literally straightened by the US Corps of Army Engineers. Um, uh, all of the lumpy, bumpy land that was here before has been flattened to make it convenient for tractors. And it's all very homogenized now. And we have eliminated every tree for as far as the eye can see in the name of agriculture, whereas this used to be a big forest. Now, how do we feel about that? Well, it's producing the food that we're actually eating. It's kind of hard to say it's bad while, you know, between mouthfuls of the food that came from that plot of land. And so um, can we take part of that and make it permaculture? Kind of seems like this is a slam dunk. Like we're all okay with that. Like if we were to adopt, say, 20 acres of of that million acres of farmland and we grew more calories on it using less inputs it kind of seems like that's a that's a solid win no one no one's going to complain about that so i do think yeah there's already plenty of plenty of land that's already been kind of that's that's pretty far gone from how it was, uh, you know, before we showed up or before the Native Americans showed up or whatever time. So uh, that's the land you, I guess you would say. Let's put let's try to put this back in, into our permaculture paradise. Let's terrace this and plant all our trees and uh, you know non-native trees and all that stuff. Let's definitely not touch the stuff that hasn't been touched already well oh boy uh i mean a can of worms yeah you say <laughs> have it don't touch the stuff that hasn't been touched and it's kind of like so part of me is kind of like oh i bet it's been touched <laughs> yeah and yeah. it hasn't been touched yeah. kindly but yeah. but okay uh let's not touch the stuff that hasn't been touched it is it's like I, I agree that there's some of that that's, that's yeah, but it's kind of like, um, you know, do we have a permit that's going to go out and get 200 acres and they're going to be rolling up their sleeves just when somebody shows up and says, uh, because you're a permit, you can't touch this land because I, I've decided to say that it hasn't been touched. And, and this guy, Kyle, once said in a podcast that that's naughty to touch something that hasn't been touched yet. And then the permit tries to say it has been touched. I mean, look at all this stuff. I could, I got all this evidence, and it's like, no, it hasn't. I'm saying it hasn't. So you have to not do anything here because I say. So I kind of feel like I, I don't, I don't want to state that. Um, but but what I do want to state is to say that there are people who will debate it, and 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 things of that nature. It gets really complicated. Um, so I guess I think that the question that Katie brings up is, if we're looking at a desert, should we? Should we make a jungle and a desert? And, and I kind of feel like it gets, I mean, A, I think, I think it's critical that we do. And, and I also kind of wonder, like, how much, how, I mean, first of all, we've got a lot of desert and we got, and, and the price of that land is 
damn near free because nobody wants to touch it. And the desert is getting bigger all the time. And I think that we have the ability to reverse that desertification. And when the opportunity presents itself to take on a patch of desert and then, you know, green the desert, at this time, any permi that's, that's presented with the opportunity to do it is going to be a drop in the bucket and is and especially today, any permi that takes that on and and works at it their whole life, they will not reverse global desertification. That's true. There's a there's a scale going on. It's when we get to the point where uh oh we might extinct this desert turtle because the entire desert habitat has been turned into lush, beautiful forest. Maybe that's time to have that conversation, but it's we're a long way from that. I think part of my question is, given a book called Desert or Paradise, it seems to be making a pretty clear statement that it like, sounds like you'd want the paradise um, out of those two mm -hmm. options. But if I were to guess, like this is a translation, if I were to guess, like what would, does Katie think that Sepp Holzer would say? Uh, I feel like he would go, I mean, who am I to know, but I feel like he would go to the environment and sit in the desert and look around and say, does this feel like a healthy, happy ecosystem or does this feel like a broken wasteland? I think almost every place that Sepp Holzer has ever been invited, has, his position has been, this used to be lush and green and now the choices of humans have degraded it to be a desert. And so let's restore, you know, what once was. Let's, let's bring the green and lush back. Um, and so I, I don't know of, of him ever looking at it. Now, I do think that it could be possible that for 10,000 years, there's a, there's a spot where for 10,000 years, it has only been desert. And, um, but that would take us back to the Ice Age. And it's kind of like, uh, well, during the Ice Age, it was icy, which can be a kind of a desert. But, um, and it's kind of like, uh, maybe, maybe it's time to take that into a lush jungle. But the important thing is, is that any piece of desert that we look at, it's like uh, uh, a one person trying to make a difference is going to make such a small difference on the on the global scale. Even if even if all the permies in all of the world tried, they still would not get total global desertification numbers to stop. We need more permies. Uh, yeah. And I kind of feel like the more demonstrations we can get, the better chance we have of reversing global desertification. And so it's like, I think, I think for now, let's, let's set that question aside for a hundred years. And um, I mean, the, the question itself, I think will only impede our current efforts you know, and I, I do think that there's a lot of people, I mean, for the work that I do, the number of trolls that come out of the woodwork to say don't and stop and, and you know, all of their different justifications and reasons and ugliness is, is like, it's, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that people can think of these things. And, and it's like, uh, this would be one. They would there's going to be people that are going to say, like, you know, protect the desert ecosystem, protect the existing desert ecosystem, no matter whether it's because we made it this way a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago or five thousand years ago. Doesn't matter. You know, there's a desert ecosystem that's there now and we want to preserve that. Even though we got a million acres and you're only working on 20, I don't care. I'm here to stop you. And I kind of feel like we need so many more examples. It's like, let's, let's, let's skip that. Let's do the Sepulcher thing. 
we will wave our hands dismissively and say, you're just jealous and, uh, okay. and, and get back to work. Yes. All Moving right. On. Moving on. Water is the key. Water is the key to a stable climate. And uh, I, I, I just, I just wrote, I just marked that up. That's, that's kind of it. Water is the key to a stable mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that is true. I think that is true. I think that uh, the work that Sepp's doing, the work that Zach Weiss is doing, which is basically based on Sepp's work. Um, I think that there's other people too. Uh, uh, John D. Liu, um, uh, Willie Smits. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeff Lawton. I think the work, the work of many, many people, I mean, this work of reversing desertification is the key. It is, it is the most important key. Uh, imagine a landscape of ponds and lakes. During the day, the sun warms the water up, but only on the surface. Deeper down, the water stays cool. During the night, that heat is slowly released, and through dew formation and evaporation, the whole area is cooled and kept moist. Universities do not teach the knowledge of natural water management yet. A lot of what I talk about contradicts general theories and is completely new to hydrologists and water engineers. This does not come as a surprise to me, however, because at universities, water is treated as a chemical formula and not as a living being. I can only cooperate with water and understand it when I treat it with respect and as a living being. Purple? So he probably imagines things through water's eyes as well. True. As what he does, does water with trees want? and pigs. What does the water want? True. Is it purple? Is this purple? Is Sep purple? It's Sep purple. Sep's a little purple, purple but he gets ground results. Well, the water has microbes in it. The microbes are alive. True. Mm -hmm. Is that what he's talking about? I don't think that's what he's talking about. Yeah. I think he's talking about, that's part of what he's talking about, but I think it's, you know, Oxygen. It's like it's a shortcut for the microbes and minerals and oxygen and other dissolved things in the water that are that you don't get when you when you treat water like when you distill water or you put it in a um, you know a big reservoir and you put it in concrete and all that stuff. I'm pretty nerdy. The, you know, in Star Trek, there's Scotty. He's like, he basically treats the Enterprise as if it were alive. Uh, I think a lot of systems or, you know, cars or other, if you treat them as if they were alive because they're a system and they have different parts and they're sort of doing well or not doing well, there are a lot of parallels, maybe useful parallels. Yeah, you got to treat it holistically, the whole water, as opposed to just you know, pH and dissolved solids or whatever you could put on a graph. Any more comments about water is the key? Paul, do you think he's speaking more as a like, like people who get their car name and like that's the relationship to it? Or do you feel like it's purple? I, I kind of feel like there's some purple there, but I also kind of feel like it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like dowsing. When you when you go out and you do the dowsing thing, and you got the rods and you're walking along, and then those rods move and you didn't move them, you're like, holy shit. And then there's all the scientists that say dowsing's a bunch of bullshit. It's all lies and crap. And and it's like, but when you're actually out there holding the rods and then the rods move and you're like, I didn't do that. 
I think that what we're looking at here is something that we do not yet understand. Mm -hmm. Anything that we call magic is something that has not yet been explained by science. I, yeah. And I think that one of the things, instead of using the word magic, we could use the word purple. Now, you know, with the purple stuff is like a lot of stuff that is total dingbatism and will, you know, for the next hundred thousand years, it'll, it'll just be written off as wackadoodle crap back in the two thousands. Um, so, uh, I, I kinda, I kinda feel like with in this in the realm of purple i think that there's a lot of stuff that we do not yet understand or that science has not yet been able to explain i mm -hmm. think that there is stuff that sep is doing that is beyond my comprehension when it comes to water as far as like life in water and what he's talking about right here. So I kind of I kind of feel a couple of things. On the one hand, I feel like the dude has his purple streak. And simultaneously, I feel like this is probably something that is legit and I don't yet understand it. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've thoroughly dodged your question. And I think I did a good job of it. <laughs> you should go into politics, Paul. <laughs> I'm question dodging. I I feel like uh, part of me thinks it's hooey, and part of me thinks it's stuff I just haven't figured out yet. And and it's like I'm confused and intrigued, and um, and you know what? It's it's sap. And so if Sep says it, I can't help but think that I've, I've yet got a lot more to learn. So that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, in the next section, food should be our medicine. The solution is always the same to me. We need an all-embracing ecological rejuvenation of our planet not ordered from the top down but on all levels decentralized self-sufficient and diverse ah and that's nice that's i feel as that's, that's that's uh, that's exactly it and i i kind of feel like whenever uh i go onto the internet it's away from permies and then i start to talk about my book every single time these guys show up and they say i am the greatest criminal in the world because i am blaming the individual for the problem that we have now instead of blaming the people that have done the great wrongs. And, um, and so therefore I'm, I'm getting people rather, so people are now going to go because they followed my advice and they're gonna build a rocket mass heater. Whereas they could take that same time and they could write angry letters to politicians and tell them to stop being bad. So therefore, I am. Uh, people are leaving, I guess, their strategy and coming to my strategy, and therefore their strategy is less likely to be effective. They're so jealous. <laughs> yeah, they're just jealous. Fuck those guys. Um, I think there's some truth to what they're saying. I, uh, however, I kind of think that it, for every 100 people that are angry at, at bad guys, only one of them will do anything and what they do is really 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 small like like write to a politician or or carry a sign to a protest or or something like that 
Whereas I feel like the people that are coming onto our team are um, actually changing things within their own life and they are reducing their own personal carbon footprint. And then as they continue down this path, then um, others observe what they are doing and, and follow it. I, I just kind of feel like if you've got a hundred people who are angry at bad guys and only one of them is actually like writing to politicians or whatever to, to express their anger and the other 99 are just complaining to people at the local bar or, you know, at Thanksgiving or, or whatever. And that's, that's as far as they go. I, I do feel like what we're talking about, things that you actually do at home, I, I think that that does make a big difference. Or if you have acreage and you implement the things that Sepulcher advocates. Or I would say that if you uh, meet somebody who has acreage and you can tell them about the things that Sepulcher advocates, I think that this is doing way more. I think the things that are in this book, the things that we're observing in the video right now, the the pictures that we're looking at right now, the all of these things is evidence of things that have been done. And and they're amazing. They are abs. I mean, that's another thing too. Before we were talking about, well, what if you have a million acres of desert and you got 200 acres? Should you make a jungle there? in that 200 acres and then comes the whole thing of like there i think there's a lot of people that are going to say it can't be done and and like hey this is this is not a recipe but totally a recipe <laughs> and so it's like it clearly it can be done you know we just need to learn how to do it All right. Um, That's a funny picture. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I um, I don't know. I feel like the hoogles. So there's a picture of, of two hoogles. So I'm going to tell the pod people what the pictures that we're looking at. There is the first hoogle. It says the hoogle we want with a smiley face. And it has nice steep sides. And then the next picture is the hoogle we end up with and the sides have kind of sloughed off and now the sides are no longer steep. Well, and, and also the, the dirt's really thin on the top and it's, it's really thick at the bottom because the dirt's all fallen down. Right. Right. I feel like the hoogles that we have here at base camp are still quite steep. They're holding up rather well. And so we still have the hoogle we want as opposed to the, the hoogle that we end up with, which has a frowning face. We still have the smiley face. Now, I think, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this podcast where we had a guy here who is a permaculture instructor and he was, uh, he stopped by to be a guest instructor. And he basically made this argument that we have created the thing that we want, the smiley face hoogle culture. And he says, it will become what you end up with, the frowny face. And it is inevitable. And, um, and, and the thing that I told him at the time is like, well, I think at the time that he was telling me this, it's like, these Google cultures at this moment are now two years old and they're still holding this shape. And it's like, I know why they're holding this shape and I've been trying to tell you, but you keep saying it doesn't matter why, because they're going to always universally end up with the frowny face design. And I don't, I'm sure I've conveyed this in podcasts, haven't I? Like basically it's, it's, if you've got your logs, like in this picture, all the sticks seem to be going along the hugel culture universally mm -hmm. but if you also run some of your sticks the opposite direction you know short sticks going the other way or branches and stuff like that mm -hmm. then you're going to add this uh 
uh, soil structure, this, this structural engineering that will help it to stay upright. It'll keep it from sloughing out. So the, the thing that you see in the frowny face of culture is mm -hmm. the angle of repose. So if you right. just have this dirt and sand and you just make a pile, that's what you end up with is the angle of repose. But then if you add structural engineering to it, which will be the sticks going the other way also, oh. it kind of holds it all together. So, so not having all the sticks be parallel or roughly parallel with Correct. the axis aligning with the long axis of the hugel bed. Correct. You know, that might be new. That might be new. Thank oh, you wow. for saying it. So I, so it's now, now it's in a podcast. See, I can't remember all the things that I've said in podcasts before. I do feel like there's a lot more to be said and a lot more to add in. Feel like you uh, might that's been out there somewhere. I don't know where, and I know I got that from more than just a visit to Wheaton Labs, but um, in any case, um, it does work. It's true. <laughs> and, I mean, look at ours. Look at ours here. There they are. And they're holding up. So. I think so it's harder to draw the picture. Sorry, it's harder to draw the picture where the sticks are all higgledy piggledy. Uh, and it's easier to draw the sticks like this picture where they're all sticking out at one end. Uh, and it might give people the false impression that that's the only sticks that you have is the all one direction ones. True. True. So I've built and helped build a lot of Google beds. And I had always built them with the logs going the long axis of the Google bed, like the diagram implies. And I would... I got to go to Wheaton Labs for the first time last fall for the BB20 event, and a group of us built Google Beds. And Josiah came up and he was talking to us about the importance of the logs going perpendicular to the long axis. So we had logs that were three feet and then two and a half feet and then two feet and 18 inches and 12 inches as you go up to help make that pyramid. And it was just such a different experience in laying a hugel bed and it just makes so much sense that they would stay um, in that nice rounded tall shape because you've got the structure in there. It's kind of funny because uh, here when I kind of want to like record a podcast about something I feel like all the people are here like well what would we talk about there's really there's really nothing to say. And I kind of feel like, I think in order to, to kind of get it going, we need like the, the people that are here and the people that are not here. So that way mm -hmm. there can be the questions because for so, I mean, when, when I see stuff on the internet where people are like, look at my Hugo culture, I don't say anything because I want them to be encouraged that they're trying stuff. But at the same time, I'm kind of thinking like, okay, there's eight things that you did that pissed me off. <laughs> it's like, uh, but Hey, you know, yeah, there's wood in there and there is dirt. So uh, fair enough. That is Hugo culture. And I'm glad you're doing it. And I wish there were several things that you would do differently. And then it, and then every once in a while, I will pop in and say a little something. And universally, I get shouted down by dumb fucks um, saying stupid shit. And it's like, they've just got no idea. Um, and, and it's like, uh, you can tell that they're right because they can say it very loudly and they can say it repeatedly. And so that proves that they are correct. And so I kind of, I don't know, this is, this is part of what inspires me. Like I've got to get that book written, the Hugel culture book. Have any of you looked at the Hugel culture book? What's there? Oh, I I've have, that, I've got that I've, draft of the Hugel culture book. Yeah. I've looked at it recently because I've got some big Hugels that are in process down at the farm and I needed to refer to it. I, I mean, I kind of need to get that book done.
because of all of the stupid shit that I see. And I just kind of feel like uh, we've got to get we've got to get the better information out there. Um, and uh, the misinformation is like overwhelming the the accurate information. And uh, and I suppose it's fair to say that maybe each person is an artisan in Hugo culture. But when they present their style, they don't present it as an artisanal approach. Like this is the way that they choose to do it. They present it as the only way to do it. And um, so I kind of feel like I'm willing to give up ground on like, oh, the way I do it is just a way. It's not the way. Um, provided that, you know, I can, I'm allowed to have that space, such as being able to um, confound the angle of repose by adding some structural engineering inside the Hugel culture by just having some sticks going the um, perpendicular direction, side to side. Pretty you know? cool. I mean, the, the, the big logs that are going the way that, you know, the way that you would normally think, those are good too. But the side to side stuff is also good and helpful. So um, I think the other one that drives me crazy is when people make a big pile of logs and then start throwing dirt on the pile. Mm. That one drives me nuts. It's like that won't that won't work. You need to put down a, a layer of wood and a layer of soil and a layer of wood and a layer of soil and a layer of wood and a layer of soil. That's that's the way to do it. And then people who make hugel culture beds that are only like a foot and a half tall, those those make me crazy. Also, it's kind of like, um, oh no, uh, make them seven feet tall, please, seven feet tall at least. I mean, if you want to go bigger, that's cool. But the stuff that's a foot and a half tall, um, no thanks. And then, and then there's the stuff where they first dig a pit. And then they throw the wood into the pit. You know, I I'm, I kind of mm -hmm. think if you can if you can dig down, put the wood on the ground, and then dig your paths, and then where your path is going to go, put that soil on top. So, as your path mm -hmm. goes down, and your hula culture goes up, you only have to make something that's roughly three or four feet tall. And then your path went down also three or four feet and you're done in in much less time sorry we as usual we go off talking about hugel culture in the middle of doing something else all right well i mean sepp Holzer introduced me to the topic so hugels that's true that's true and we're and he's, i'm sure there's going to be some of that far, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be some of that coming up in the book. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> page six, landscapes are emptied <laughs> because of land consolidation projects intended to create heavy machinery friendly farm fields. Regions that were covered with mixed forests just a few generations ago are now bare monocultures or agricultural deserts. All the humid habitats, the lakes and ponds, the bogs, the hedges and gardens are gone. Yeah. All right. I think I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the thing I like is where he's, he mentions agricultural deserts. This is my first time. I mean, I, I've seen him point at a conifer forest over and over again and say it's a desert. And um, that is powerful. It, it did take me a while to grok that, but I, I feel very comfortable with it now and have for many years. I get it and I agree. Um, right. Oh, we we're talking about desert for a long time. This is what he means. The agricultural desert. Desert or paradise? Yeah.
which by the way uh somebody was saying something about how this book does not talk about how to convert deserts into paradise but i think it does i do think it does but i don't think that's when i when i first saw the title of the book i thought he's gonna this is gonna be just an instructional going from a to b but with but reading this first chapter it makes me think that the deserts are everywhere it's not just in the desert that it is a desert the desert is the conifer uh, desert. It is the the agricultural monocrops. It is it is the the dry swamps that we have houses on now. It's it's not just the desert that you might think of in the picture. If you look at the top of the book. Uh, it's all everywhere. It's it's much bigger. So the picture at the top of the book, I think, is the his um, Spanish project, and that is a place where it was like this lush uh, forest and savanna. It was, it was brushy and thick with life. And then of course, what you see here is it's dying. And then, and this is the place where those are, I think those are oak trees and the oak trees are all dying. And the solution from the pre-Holzer people the pre-Holzer experts was to inject the trees with mm -hmm. something to fight off whatever fungus or whatever is killing them. And Sepp's position was that the fungus is part of nature. And it's like, you've, you've killed this land. And so these trees don't fit here anymore. We're going to have to grow something else here. So I'm putting a fungus in there to take these trees out for this other thing we're going to grow now. I, I kind of, but anyway, what Sepp did is that he believed that this place used to have a whole bunch of lakes. And so he wanted to reintroduce those lakes um, and save the trees. The lakes would save the trees. And sure enough, the trees, the trees came back to life once, once Sep reintroduced the lakes. All right. I am uh, moving ahead several pages because the next thing I have marked is on page 10. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about before page 10? Yeah, I have something on page eight where he says water needs to be where nature has designed it to be as moisture in the soil and in forests and as moving water in natural river streams and lakes mm -hmm. only water that is allowed to seep into the ground and connect with the soil mineralizes itself and becomes healthy drinking water only water that is allowed to move cleans itself i just thought that was really interesting the argument against pond liners. Oh, right, right. So I, I do believe that all of Sepp's um, ponds, all of his um, lakes and ponds, I mean, they're going, the, part of the design is they're going to be leaky. Mm -hmm. Just get over it. They're going to leak. And that's just part of it. That's part of how it works. I, All right. I, what I took from this page and from a lot of other pages is kind of the inverse of the, the permaculture saying the, the problem is the solution, where he's talking about all their solutions are the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I it's wish like, I... There's, there's like one initial problem that was like, you know, 200 years ago, there was some little problem and someone came up with a solution for it. And that created three more problems and, and and you extrapolate that and here we are now. I wish I could memorize the story along those lines for Yellowstone National Park. And I remember that it was like a hundred some years ago, they needed to fix a problem that they saw. So they did this big project to fix things and then that caused a bunch like for example one of the things was is that there were too many wolves they they 
went out and, and killed all the wolves. And I'm sure we've all seen that thing in the last few years where it showed how bringing the wolves back has improved things at Yellowstone. Um, yes. But it's like, you know, then they had the, the giant fires that were the result of some of their previous choices to fix things. So that, yeah, this, I love that. The solution is the problem. Um, so, and I, and maybe, and, and that was part of the thing that I guess uh, Katie was bringing up earlier. Like, if you've got this big desert, should we? And so we're saying, yes, we got to bring our solution there. And it could turn out to be that someday the solution is the problem. It's, it's like that whole story about Bill Mollison going to that town in Australia, which the, the whole town was about to, to go under. And then um, they hired Bill Mollison to basically save the town because the desert was just taking everything and the whole town was going to be just consumed by the desert and there'd be no town left. So Bill Mollison jumped in and he did a whole bunch of permaculture stuff and saved the town. And now they hate him because of it, <laughs> because of all these fucking honey locust trees and their giant thorns everywhere. So, turns out that Bill Mollison planted thornless honey locusts all over the place. But, of course, eventually they grew up and had babies, and not all of the babies were thornless. And, uh, you know, honey locust thorns are fascinating things, but the honey locust did really, really well there and re-greened the whole area, captured the area from the desert, took it back from the desert. And, so there you go. There you go. You get to be hated for saving them. Anything else before page 10? What I was saying, look, the reason I was asking the question, um, should we, is more of a question of what what are we valuing? What is what is the high point? It seems like biodiversity, water, especially reading in the first chapter, the importance of having water in all the layers. Um, as much as possible for the area. Uh, it seems like that's that's the high goal. If I'm, I don't know if I'm right. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot for my own personal goals, and um, I want to feed myself. I want to live in a plethora of life. I I want to have a Montana jungle. I, I, I want to have something that's um, massive, growies, and full of food. Um, and I want to have, I want to have rich soil, rich gardens, mag magnificent horticultural stuff. I want to have a deep, meaningful, romantic relationship with nature. And I see, and I guess, you know, while Billions of people seek relationships of so many different flavors. I'm seeking a particular flavor of relationship. So my, my end goal is what I keep thinking of as a jungle and uh, a food, a food heavy jungle rich with life. And I want to live in this space that's rich with life. That's that's what I want. And then, of course, you know, the way that I get there is to contemplate all of the water. I, I, I kind of can't help but think that, yeah, the, the water is the key. And so I need to, I need to think about that first and foremost. Um, I think that a lot of people start thinking about the water and they want to do water catchment systems. And they're like going to get barrels and pipes and, and tanks and gutters and uh, things of that nature. And to me, I, it, it, feels, it feels contrary to the kind of romance I want to have with nature. So I, I want something like when it comes to hugel culture, that's more in line with the kind of romance that I want. 
I mean, capturing the water, the thing with all the tanks and barrels, that will work. But I feel like I end up with a plastic based relationship. It's, it's made of petroleum things. It's, it's less natural. I want, I want something better. So I don't, I'm not thinking like the water is the end goal, although ponds and creeks are definitely a part of it. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the jungle, the food jungle as the goal, the Montana food jungle. But that's just me. Maybe other people, it's all about the water. The water is the destiny. What are your guys' destinations? Mm. Kyle, what is your destination? What do you I'm see? I'm looking for a uh, full dirt dump, girded tube. I'd uh, like to have a, uh, a little food forest and not really uh, have to do much except for harvest food, eat it, and then, you know, spend the rest of my time doing whatever. Julia. Yes. What are you, what are you, what's your destination? What do you want? What's your end goal? I, that is a good question. Okay. Elliot, who is... Mm -hmm you know, married to Julia. <laughs> what is your end goal? Is it safe, do you think, to answer that? <laughs> hey, she left that door open and you're standing <laughs> right next to her. So I've been set up, I is, tell you. This is your chance. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question because as you say it, I'm like, I don't know what my goal is. I know what the direction is that I'm trying to move. I don't know what the goal is. And part of that is because the idea is that, well, you sort of reach a goal and then you stop. And um, oh, I, I like don't that. know that there's a stopping on, on a lot of this. And so, you know, the direction is to try and move in a direction, you know, move towards something which uh, promotes vitality globally, right? Not just locally, but globally. So um, minimizing carbon footprints, you know, no chemical stuff, uh, trying to minimize residues. There's the whole, you know, thinking, you know, seven generations ahead kind of a deal, um, you know, that feeds into that. And I think it's probably easier to describe that as a, as a path, as a direction. I like that because then it's kind of like, I want to, I want to get started in this direction. And then I feel confident that soon a path will present itself. And then I'm going to follow that path and see where it goes. Yes. And that has been very much the case, which is a whole nother podcast in itself, if you want, on, you know, what has been going on for us. Um, because there's a lot that one doesn't know, right? I mean, think about it this way. If you grab anybody off the street and they're like, oh, look at me, I'm a one on the beat and eco scale. And you say, great, you want to do these things. What are your goals? their goals are necessarily going to be probably something which is at a two or a three on the Wheaton Eco scale. And that's it. And that really shouldn't be their goal, right? I mean, that, that should be the next thing that they see, but you don't want them to stop there. You want them to keep moving. No, I, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think, I think that uh, there's a certain bit of purple to this, and there's also a lot of art to it to say, I, I want to move in this general direction. And then I won't, I, I won't know I'm there until I'm there. And I might not ever get there. Like, like when I'm getting close, you know, 
to a, a conclusion. So it's, it's perpetually, because part of it is, is to like, I want to head down this path and I'm going to learn a lot about myself. I'm going to learn a lot about this land that I'm developing a romance with. And, um, and then I'll find out, I might change my mind 176 times. And Absolutely. I and I think that if I stick rigidly to a goal or to a plan, I am almost guaranteed sadness. Whereas if I keep it flexible and open, I might find in one tenth the effort, I can end up with something I love 10 times more. Right. And there's also an epistemological question, I think, in terms of, you know, what is it that we know? And until you've spent some time on a piece of property, staring at it, thinking about the trees, thinking like the trees, um, you don't really know how to even ask yourself where you should go and what you should do um, as well. And so I mean, there is necessarily a journey to this. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that makes it purple, um, but you, you, you know, knowledge is cumulative and you have to start building that knowledge somewhere. And as you build it, you may change your, your mind about where you are and where you want to be. Maybe we should have a conversation about what is purple. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, I think that when we first brought up purple, the, the very first thing we said is there's a little bit of purple in all of us. Some people are just more purple than others. And, and then it's like, I think, I think, like, I, I believe I said that when I stand next to my brother, I look day glow purple. And then mm -hmm. when uh, I stand next to a um, lot of people in the permaculture mo movement, I look, I look, um, pretty rock solid brown. And so uh, I, I kind of feel like I'm in between. I'm in the middle. Um, but I think I think within the world of purple, there's going to be stuff that it's like, I don't have a logical explanation for this piece, but I do have something about this piece I just like. And I don't know why I like it. And I get to, I get to pursue things that I like, and I don't have to justify it to anybody. And to me, that's, that's purple. And I think that there's something to be said for like, I like this direction. And I have, I am not going to be held subjected to your word goal. And I'm going to travel this path and I'll see what goals present themselves. And I'll probably dismiss all of them pursuing this other thing as I see fit. And in fact, I choose to not even be part of your whole weird ass goal conversation. <laughs> I mean, respect. I, I, I think that that's, that is uh, um, the best answer. I, I don't think there, there can be a better answer. I think that's, I mean, for describing what is purple in some degrees, but also like when we're talking about what is the goal. I think it's like, here I am. I got this piece of land. I'm going to start developing a romance here. I have some thoughts about where I'm going but let's just see where the winds take me. But Elliot, you were saying something about like, I don't think it's necessarily purple. Kind of makes it sound like, you know, I don't want to be purple. Purple's the bad guys. And I, and I kind of want to say purple's not the bad guys. Oh, purple. okay. I, I don't mean to say that uh, in that instance, um, that, uh, that yeah purple is bad um and my own version of purple is maybe a little different and it's you know um, allowing a bit of a mystical element in i i, I guess the, the idea that one doesn't necessarily know what 
what's going to happen is just that we can't really predict the future and we reserve the right to, you know, change our, our opinions and our choices based upon what we learn between now and then. And I, I don't see that as being either purple or anti-purple. So, uh, oh, look, there's a picture of Katie. Um, <laughs> on her hugel culture. Um, I, I kind of feel like uh, um, I'm, I said uh, plethora, living in a plethora of life. And um, I'm going to guess that you're like, that sounds nice. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to say um, food jungle. And I'm thinking that you're going to say, oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, those two things might show up on your property, as will ponds and little creeks and 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 things of that nature that that you will have created. So as we're talking about water in the landscape, the other pieces might be more appealing than the water piece, which is appealing, but it's more like that'll be part of the greater final package. It isn't the destination. Fair? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, Elliot, does that sound okay? Yes, I accept that. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to take the same question that I started with, which um, uh, now Elliot has totally warped the question in a good way and so but i'm gonna but just to, to make sure everybody has a go katie what's what's your response to this question oh i am way over my head in my goals i have a a passion for wanting to sepify a piece of hawaii and i have a postage stamp on it basically, uh, as far as progress. <laughs> I'm, I am not at that level. I am not anywhere near, anywhere near that level. But for some reason, I have latched on to this mighty goal very far away from myself as if something I really, really want to try to do. Um, I mean, not that I would succeed, but that I would try, that would give it a really good try. Uh, I want to be uh, like something people could come and look at it. I want to be stable for a long, long time so that I have, I can show long-term results. Um, I want to try to help the local farming community with things that they need, like way above my head goals that I, I have not the ability to achieve at, at this point. All right. Try, you know, shoot for the moon, shoot for the magnificence. Try, 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 try. See how far you can get and and see if see if you can create a magnificent and beautiful thing that others have not dared yet to imagine am i close yeah <laughs> okay opalin you're the last one yeah i've um sort of been contemplating this and i really like the concept of a journey and not a destination. Um, I really would love to cultivate uh, a food forest and and have a much closer connection with the food that I eat and not um, purchase so much. Um, and at the same time, I try to make realistic goals along that path that don't get me overwhelmed. Um, because that tends to stall my progress. Um, yeah. So um, probably like if you had an acre, that might stall you. I kinda, no. No. I, no. Um, 
Hmm. I know that, for example, I converted a shipping container into a housing for myself. And um, that was just way too big of a project. So I got out a binder and I broke it down into the electrical and the, um, you know, all the different systems that needed to go into converting a metal box into a house. Um, so having like key points on the journey, but given that I don't have an acre to play with right now, um, it, it's sort of, you know, going beyond the dreaming stage might, I'm not sure. See, I kind of feel like, um, for most people that if you give them something that's like an eighth of an acre and you say, this is your garden patch, that they will get 10 times more done than if you give them 10 acres for the reasons that you just suggested. So like with an eighth of an acre that they will make a reasonable garden but if they have 10 acres, they will spread themselves thinly over the whole 10 acres. And after a year, they have almost nothing to show for it. So when you said your, your thing about like, I got to make sure that I avoid the overwhelm. That's what I was thinking of is how like, the, the wise thing to do is that if you had 10 acres would be to limit yourself to looking at an eighth of an acre. And then once that is magnificent, then move to the next eighth of an acre, as opposed to like, oh, I've got 10 acres. I'm going to do this massive design for the whole 10 acres. And then I'm going to try to implement this massive design. And 10 years later, I'll find that I've really accomplished pretty much none of it. Whereas, yeah, so I've been co-managing 120 acres for the last decade, and we would look at the forest and the woodland in like three to five acre plots that we would work on for a year or three, depending on how dense it was, how much um, of that monoculture desert uh, needed to be transformed. Um, and so also, while also like designating this chunk has this goal and this chunk has this goal. Um, and a lot's been done, but not a lot of food has been grown. So I, that, that's, I kind of, I kind of feel like, and now I'm going to, I'm going to step beyond what's in Sepp's book. I'm going to step beyond what's in Mollison's book and, and I've got my own philosophy set. And um, I, I feel like rather than having, like I almost feel like the phrase permaculture farm is an oxymoron. <laughs> I was just reading that article actually. Oh, okay. And, and I, I prefer permaculture gardens. Mm. So then, and then I think and I, and I kind of, my philosophy set is kind of going towards gardening gardeners. And, and now it's <laughs> like, you kind of need to have like a dozen people and four of them will turn out to be gardeners. And so then you have four gardens. And, and that's to, with my, I don't know, let's say artistic thought artistic design, um, artisan permaculture, I don't know. I, I'm, I think more in that general direction than like the more property-wide design. Like here's the, the design and all of you people are now going to implement this design and you will love it, all right? I command thee to love this design, all right? now. <laughs> get to loving, all right? And and I kind of feel like I prefer the idea of each person is their own artisan. 
and I think I think in this stuff that we're about to read, Sep does say some stuff about that, about how the most one of the most important ingredients we need is diversity. Oh, I think I'm in that picture. Yeah, you can see me. I'm like right in the middle. Do you see me there? Yeah. I'm wearing my red shirt. <laughs> You're staring at you can see my bald spot. <laughs> <laughs> that is indeed the key identifying mark right right from that angle and i have video from that thing that was the first time i ever met sep that was the very first day i ever met sep and uh i i took video from his presentation there and it was one some of the earliest videos i ever put up on my youtube channel it's where he told the story of the was it a newt and he was and he was like seven and he and his friends had decided that it was um a uh an, an alligator or a crocodile or something like that yeah a crocodile and so he was like charging his friends to look at the crocodile um but it was actually a newt <laughs> anyway yeah see i'm in that picture too all right um I'm going to go on to the next little piece. Um, he says, I had no idea what permaculture actually was then. I began reading a book by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, the founders of permaculture in Australia, and also read one by Masanobu Fukuoka, an agricultural pioneer in Japan, and I felt enthusiastic because I found a lot of similarities in all three methods, especially concerning companion planting and some working methods. Eventually, I renamed my method and it became Holzer's Permaculture. So um, the funny thing is, is that I think in 2012, I was asking him about um, about Fukuoka. And uh, I don't know, he went into some weird mode where he needed to bash Fukuoka. So he talked about some project that Fukuoka did that failed. And I think I was trying to ask, like, you know, something about there are similarities between his work and Fukuoka's work. And so what would be the stark differences or something like that? And and he just went into defensive mode and never answered the question. <laughs> He's just jealous. <laughs> so let's wave our hands dismissively and move along. Um, I'm about to read something from page 13. Does anybody want to talk about anything before page 13? No. Okay. All right, this is from the section called Symbiotic Interactions. The phenomenon is when legumes take on atmospheric nitrogen via rhizobia at their roots. When the roots eventually rot, the nitrogen enriches the surrounding soil. I'd been saying the same goes for potassium and phosphorus, but people did not believe me. Now, I could share my insights with the students. I had observed that plants take on different colors depending on the species of other plants growing next to them. For example, why does rhododendron stay red and does not turn white with certain neighboring plants? Why does radicchio remain red and does not turn brown or go lighter? So um, this is going to be a big polyculture thing. I, I feel like uh, there's a lot of people who, OK, in this picture here, do you see there is a woman wearing yellow, like four from the left? And so that woman right there, that woman is a physician from the East Coast. And um, 
there was a day when she told me at this event that um, uh, the rates of cancer today are 400 times higher than they were several hundred years ago. And I said, surely you mean 400% higher. And she got rather angry at me for suggesting that. And so she was very emphatic to say 400 times higher. And this is not a typo, not a mathematical error, 400 times higher. So that's, that's her. And then Julia, a physician on this very podcast right now, mm -hmm. said, doubt. <laughs> and Julia and I went several rounds on this, and we did find information that suggested 400. But in my book, we said only 100. And that, that made Julia only a little cranky. Not as, not as cranky as she was for the number 400. Yeah. But the proof that we found out, the, the information that we found said 400. And so that also, uh, so I believe that when I changed it to 100, the cranky sounds that Julia was making stopped. So the, the 100 plus the, the evidence. Is this correct, Julia? Am I telling the story accurately here? They, they got quieter. <laughs> so but there she is that was that was the that was the gal was the that person. that kind of got me started on that whole thing about really 400 times i mean i would have believed four times or 20 times but 400 is is dramatic all right yes, next piece my explanation for this was that through the continuous decay of the roots, nutrients are released into the soil and are then being passed on to other plants via mycorrhiza in the soil. That is how symbiotic interaction in polycultures works. Each plant releases different nutrients at different times through decay, and each plant requires different nutrients at different times, depending on whether they flower or fruit, for example. Leaves also do this. They sweat nutrients that are washed away by dew or rain and are then fed back to the roots. If you look under a comfrey plant, you'll see the ground getting kind of dusty. Oh, am I doing a photo op there? Somebody wanted to take a picture with mm -hmm. me? Is that what that is? I can't tell who it is. It looks like. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I, I mean, that was back in 2009. I was kind of a nobody then, right? I mean, in the world of permaculture, I was probably far better known for my software engineering stuff. But I don't know. I guess some people still wanted to get their picture taken with me. That's kind of cool. Maybe she's a software enthusiast. Oh, maybe so. I did run into them occasionally. Um, Where is it? Those are hookles, right? Yes, yes. Those are, and those they are directed. They are, their building is being directed by Sep himself. This is from uh, Sep's website. Oh, is it? Okay, all right. So, um, uh, this is this is the location we were standing here. Um, the, where Sep told me this important thing without a translator, because the translators apparently refused to translate. And uh, so, so what Sep did is, is he pointed at himself, gesturing to himself, and he says, Elka, Elka, Elka. And then he points at me and he says, Elefanta, <laughs> Ele Elefanta. So he just needed me to know that he thought I was fat. <laughs> but it was at this very site where he decided to, to let me know this. Um, Moral support. Oh, dear. I, or that you had a big nose. 
<laughs> well, the translator oh, said something like, well, it's not like he's not fat, too. And so it's like, uh, <laughs> okay, whatever. He was a fat elk, and you were just a large elephant. I mean, that's, an elephant is not fat. An elephant is merely large. <laughs> So, um, hey, um, can, can we um, swing back to um, that text, though, because I one of the things I thought that he sets himself apart from um, from Mollison and uh, what's his name there, you know, right away is in his willingness and his advocacy of using power tools like big power tools, like using excavators. Mollison advocates the use of excavators. Well, okay. So um, the way Sepp is putting it forth there, he is differentiating himself that uh, some of the smaller scale stuff that he was reading about, it seemed like, anyway, I mean, that was his takeaway that you couldn't be doing this by hand. You couldn't be doing this with a shovel and that the needs of restoring the earth um, are sort of so great that you can't do this without machinery. And I, I think that's not entirely true. And this is when Julia will chime in and say, Julia, oh, come on, less plateau. Anyway, so, uh, you know, where if you happen to have a whole bunch of Chinese available and then you can put them to work and do all sorts of things. And, you know, you can you know, be an Egyptian or an Egyptian slave and, you know, get a whole bunch of stuff done as well. But um, at least I, I thought it interesting that for Sepp, that's a defining difference for him between what he's doing and what other people are doing. Now, it may not be an actual difference in the real world, but for Sepp, that is a big difference. I don't know if Sepp has ever written it, but I know I've heard him say it many times. And, that, and what Sepp says is that it was big machinery that made the problem. So it will take big machinery to fix the problem. Um, yeah. Now, I think he says that in the chapter. I know he says it can't be done with a spade. And I think that Elliot makes a good point that it can be done with a spade. You just might need, you know, like a little bit of a barn raising effort of sorts, yeah. you know, like a hundred people with a hundred spades. But at the same time, um, <clears throat> Mike Ayler, he built the first $50 house using a shovel and he had no equipment up there. In fact, if you go to that spot, it's kind of like, yeah, you're not really going to get equipment up there. So um, I kind of feel like it can be done, but it'll be so much slower. I mean, if you've ever tried to do it with a shovel and a wheelbarrow and you worked at it for a few hours and then you bring in an excavator. Wow. Like, an yeah. Ex you know, an excavator is going to get done in an hour, what might take me a couple of weeks to do. It's, yeah. it's profound. So, um, I, <laughs> I, I like the idea of saying something along the lines of the eighth of an acre thing, like what we were just talking about with Opalin, where that I think you get so much done. I mean, look at this picture here. There they are. They got their shovels out and they're doing shovely things. Um, <clears throat> so there is some truth to it. At the same time, there's that saying that uh, I want to say it was Shepard Ogden that said, um, machines help you do more, but experience less. Hmm. I, I think that there is something that's a little on the Zen side, a little, uh, possibly even a little purple that you get from when you do it with a shovel that you don't get when you do it with an excavator. Right. 
I have a quote here from page 14. Okay. So he says, humanity has spent generations on land consolidation, deforestation, regulating rivers, and draining and building canals and culverts. We cannot expect to undo all this with a spade. Big steps are asked for here. I, yeah. Um, and that's why I didn't mark it as to read. I, I think that there is a lot of truth to it, but it's not absolutely true. Yeah. You get enough people together, you can get a lot done without. I, I remember there was a time when um, he was here in Montana. He was uh, over in White, White Fork. I think it was White Fork. Three Forks. He was in Three Forks. That's where it is. He, and, uh, and he was presenting to a group of like 40 people, 50 people, something like that. And, and we're down in this kind of a little gully. And, um, and I'm looking at my clock and I'm thinking like, the next thing is already starting and he needs to move over there and get to the next thing. And he's still going on here. And it's like, you know, all these other things are dependent on it and all these other people are waiting and I'm not even in charge of the event, but I'm getting kind of stressed out because the schedule is not being followed. And so then he says the thing about um, uh, how these problems cannot be solved without big equipment. And then he turns to me and he wants me to validate what he just said. And my answer was, at the moment, this is the Sepp Holzer show and not the Paul Wheaton show. So I think it's important that I don't take this in my direction. And I want to point out, we've got a little bit of a schedule problem. And we need to be bebopping on up the path here to get to the next thing. And he got really pissed off at me. <laughs> because I think he just expected me to say, but of course, the end. <laughs> I validate what this man just said. And in, instead, it's like, um, I've got some thoughts in this space, and you probably don't want to hear them. You'll say catastrophe. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, all right. So I, I have a I do have a slightly different philosophy set than Sep when it when it comes to the big equipment. Although, hey, I own an excavator, and uh, uh, I'm a I'm a pretty mediocre excavator operator, and so um, I, you know clearly I'm cool with using an excavator. And um, but I also kind of feel like I talk to a lot of people all the time, and a lot of people keep saying stuff like i can't do it because i don't have an excavator and i and i kind of feel like ah. you can do it it'll just go slower in fact there's times when we've done stuff where it'd be easier to do with an excavator but the excavator is either broken or it's like on the other proper property or and we can't get it here or whatever so we just pull out the shovels and do it with the shovels and because there's, you know, 11 of us all at once, it goes a lot faster than if there's just one of us. But I don't know. I think there's a lot of times when the shovel, the shovel is grand. The shovel is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think it would be accurate to say that Sepp Holzer is sort of stepping back? I mean, certainly he outgrew his original farm <laughs> and has stepped back to sort of be like I, looking at the entire world now and saying, oh my gosh, this is a big place. You need a big equipment stack. Um, I mean, he's still using the big equipment, but I also know that he's out there with the shovel sometimes too. So, but I do think that if, because I think the next thing is, is that there's a lot of people that want results right now. And as we look at this book and learn the amazing things that he has done, both in Portugal and in Spain and in other places, those were things that used the biggest equipment that you can get. And also, it's like just 
just the amount of money spent on equipment, probably in the realm of $4 million for one event. And so um, I, and then if you tried to do that with human labor, um, it would have taken, I don't know, uh, I want to say a hundred times longer, mm -hmm. you know, and it would probably even if, and if you're going to pay those people, it's probably going to cost more than it, than you spent on the, on the equipment. So um, I, I, I feel like our society wants results and they want it now. And a cool thing with the, like the Tamara project in Portugal is that it took a couple of years to do it. So I think that's Portugal right there. I'm not sure, but I think it is. And uh, um, no, it says Ukraine, doesn't it? I'm wrong. No, it says Portugal. Oh, okay. So I just um, switched it over to Portugal. It was Ukraine before. Okay. So I think, I think that there's that, that for those people that want the big results and they want it fast, you're going to get the big equipment. And I think, I, and I think that there's a lot of people that are pushing back. Fukuoka pushed back. Um, uh, I talked to Ernie Wisner who was um, there when uh, Fukuoka and Mollison both came to the United States. They came to Ianto Evans's place in Coquille. And Ernie acted as a kind of a tour guide and stuff um, <clears throat> for these guys and um, got to hear the conversations between them. But the big thing was is that um, uh, and I think Larry Korn was there as one of the translators. Uh, but the big thing was Fukuoka felt like permaculture just has too much big equipment. He doesn't like it, all that big equipment. And, um, uh, but Mollison and Holzer both uh, groove on the big equipment, no problems. So, um, did I, have we covered this thing about the big equipment now? We good? Yeah. Yeah, we can keep going. Yeah, I think I think Sep and Sep and I think the same thing, but Sep says what he says because his mission is to get past the people that are trying to impede his work by complaining about the big equipment. Mm -hmm. So, and and I I feel for that man. Okay, what? is Holzer's permaculture. Holzer's permaculture is creating landscapes while thinking ahead for generations. I kind of like that. I, 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 I do feel like permaculture is a big part of that. How do, we, how do we get our foods to be our weeds, effectively? Above all, Holzer's permaculture means creating a hydro, hydrological balance. Holzer's permaculture is a symbiotic agriculture in harmony with nature in cycles and all inclusive. And that's everything that I've got marked for what we've agreed to read today. Mm. Does anybody else have anything else to say about what we've read today? <laughs> I'm guys... looking forward. I think he uh, he talks about a lot of things like that. I'm looking forward to in the rest of the book in this section. I really want to see what he would do, what he does with wetlands, and because uh, I've seen a lot of these other things, but not a lot what what is done on wetlands. Well, this is basically the introduction, right? Yeah. I mean, now. Now we're going to get in to the to the real substance and um, and the magnificence. And I have I uh, unlike some people on this call, I have not read one spec beyond what we've agreed to read today, and so we'll leave that to next week. But uh, 
I think this is, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Is this uh, format working for all of y'all? I like it. Yeah. yeah. And um, thank you, Kyle, for, for showing us all these fun pictures as we do this. Um, I, I think that this makes it very YouTubeable. Whereas I was a little worried that the last one, we just had a single image show for the whole time we recorded it. And um, I, I feel like that kind of made it not very YouTubeable. Yes, we need to make sure to, when we talk about the pictures, to describe what they are for the pod people. Right. We do well, about half the time. I, yeah, I, I think we do a little of that. All right. <clears throat> I think we're done. Are we got anything else to say? We got any other topics we want to talk about? I mean, this is the permaculture smackdown, right? Do we have any any tough issues that we need to that have come up in the last week that we need to to you know give our give the stink eye to or something? Uh, I think we can. I'm saving mine for another podcast. <laughs> I've got a big list. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Um, in that case. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about the mighty, the glorious, the amazing sepulcher, homesteading, and permaculture all, oh. the, time. all the time.